good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, so a bit of an overview for today. I'm going to be giving you some background, uh, some uh, aims and themes of the uh, 2017 planning bill. Uh, we'll then move into some analysis from an EDO perspective. Um, so uh, what we see is some positive changes, uh, some concerns we have with the bill and some missed opportunities that could be rectified before the bill is passed. Uh, and then we'll talk about five key areas of change in a bit more detail um, and how those, uh, the planning bill reforms relate to other legal reforms that are sort of swirling around at the moment. So uh, both Paul and Rachel have um, given you a bit of background uh, as to the evolution of planning reform over the last few years, but just to recap that for those of you who um, are relatively new to planning law. So uh, from a period of 2011 to 2013, uh, there was an uh, attempt at overhauling the planning system with a whole new act. Uh, there was an independent review panel established, consultation papers put out and, and a proposal from that, uh, that panel. The government prepared its response through a green and white paper process with further consultation and uh, eventually got their draft planning bills into Parliament, but ultimately they didn't pass the Parliament. So since then, um, the incremental reforms that uh, Rachel's been talking about so um, some of those similar themes from um, the 2013 reforms remained, but there were, um, the government looked at sort of other ways to implement some of them. Uh, there were some minor reforms to the Act along the way. We brought in, or the, the government, I should say, brought in um, a new set of um, enforcement and, and penalty regimes, which have been a positive improvement. The Department of Planning uh, itself has uh, had a bit of a shake-up. It became the Department of Planning and Environment. Uh, the Office of Environment and Heritage is still a separate agency, but there has been some change within the planning department. Uh, we saw the passage of the Greater Sydney Commission Act 2015, which um, sets up a regime for regional and district planning uh, in uh, the greater proportion of uh, New South Wales in terms of population, but also extending beyond Sydney, in fact, to the whole state, uh, setting up a regional planning process for that to be um, done in the future. And in terms of those incremental reforms, uh, in a non-legislative sense, we've seen uh, a range of um, complying development codes expand. We've seen state environmental planning policies or SEPs being reviewed and, and, uh, and amended, and regional plans that have been rolling out around, uh, around New South Wales to, as the government would say, make it happen. Uh, the aims uh, from the government's perspective of this planning law update uh, I think Paul actually touched on these, so um, community participation, strategic planning, probity and accountability, and uh, simpler and faster processes to promote confidence in the state planning system. Um, now, uh, that's not that different to what we saw in the last round of reforms. Uh, so that's a, a graphic from the 2012 Green Paper, and we see very similar themes there, community participation, strategic focus, streamlined approvals, and the last one there is provision of infrastructure, whereas this time they're perhaps emphasising the, the probity and accountability. Um, there were a few of the bolder proposals, you might say, from the last round of reforms have, have fallen away from and not been revived in this uh, round of reforms. So uh, there's no fast-track um, council-approved code developments. Uh, there's no proposal to scale back the number of, of planning zones. Uh, there's no strategic compliance certificates for developments to sort of leapfrog local zoning. Uh, and uh, there's no uh, new category of public priority infrastructure, which was proposed back then. Um, so we still have the, the state significant infrastructure, obviously. Um, in terms of the, the themes in more depth from the government, uh, so just running through those, community participation, strategic planning, processes for local and state development, uh, facilitating infrastructure, so that, that is, again, a theme. Uh, looking at voluntary planning agreements and uh, giving effect to those. Building confidence in decision-making, clearer building provisions, uh, an enhanced role for uh, design, building design, and uh, enhancing the enforcement toolkit. So, um, to, to kind of bring that together, it is a bit of a less ambitious agenda than the previous round of reforms. Um, so if this bill is passed, the Environmental Planning and Assessment Amendment Bill 2017, it'll restructure um, the order of the Act. Uh, it will uh, simplify 
and change some of the objects of the act up front. It'll require a range of um, new um, procedures like community participation plans, local strategic planning statements, minimum exhibition periods and statements of reasons for decisions. We can talk about all of those. Uh, and it will reform decision-making roles, both at the local and state level. Uh, there'll be no more modifications under the former Part 3A process uh, for major projects. And um, interestingly, though, uh, the rights for uh, developers to seek internal review of major project decisions uh, proposed to be expanded. So next I'll give you a bit of a, a high-level snapshot of what we see as some positive, negative um, changes and uh, some of the missed opportunities uh, before we drill down into the detail. So uh, some positive changes from an environment and community perspective. So there is some promise in what are proposed um, in these community participation plans. It remains to be seen what they actually look like when planning authorities develop them. Uh, we uh, think it's useful that we've got clearer minimum exhibition periods in a consolidated part of the Act, uh, and statements of reasons of decisions can inform the community uh, exactly why decisions were made. So in terms of uh, community engagement, those are some of the positives. Uh, turning to enforcement, um, so uh, the government is trying to crack down on retrospective modification of developments where something's non-compliant and then it's retrospectively uh, given approval or approval is sought. Uh, and also the government is trying to bring in a range of new uh, enforcement tools and orders and that will include stop work orders for suspected non-compliance by private certifiers and that's something that local councils have been struggling to enforce under the current um, Act. The um, planning regulators will be able to accept enforceable undertakings uh, to prevent or address non-compliance. And that means if the, um, the developer who gives that assurance uh, doesn't comply with that undertaking, uh, then the regulator can go to court um, to seek enforcement of a breach. And then on uh, some additional accountability measures, which we think are a good thing. Uh, so uh, ending Part 3A modifications, uh, with most projects moving to the state significant development category, which we'll talk about. Um, local planning panels could improve governance, clarity and consistency, but it does depend on how they have effect. There will be additional um, model codes of conduct uh, that are brought in for local and regional planning panels, and they will be developed with ICAC's input, which we think is a very positive thing. So um, those are the areas that we've identified in brief as some positive changes. There are, however, several changes that may undermine uh, the aims of probity, accountability and public confidence in the planning system. So firstly, some development requires approval from more than one agency, so not just the, um, consent or the planning consent authority. Under the bill, the planning department will be able to override expert advice from other agencies if approval timeframes aren't met or if two agencies uh, disagree. The planning secretary will have the call. Well, we're concerned that there's no clear decision criteria, like considering ESD principles, principles of ecologically sustainable development, uh, when these internal decisions are made by government. And we're particularly concerned about overriding advice from environmental and heritage agencies when in fact relatively few projects are referred for their concurrence. Um, so as you can imagine, there's a whole range of agencies that projects might be referred to, but particularly concerned in this aspect about um, the planning department overriding environmental agencies. Uh, moving on from there, the, um, uh, the Act's community, sorry, the provisions for merit appeals um, uh, against project decisions for major projects uh, for the community uh, have been uh, have not been uh, uh, improved. In other words, uh, when uh, the Planning Assessment Commission, the state level uh, planning authority, holds a public hearing into a major project, uh, merit appeal rights are removed, and we feel that that's inequitable uh, for the community. And by contrast, um, the internal review rights uh, for um, developers to seek a review of those decisions. Uh, are further expanded. Um, so we think there's a bit of an inequity in that proposal. Um, and finally, uh, I guess a query here around um, the removal of um, an early review role that the Planning Assessment Commission, that state-level body, 
has been claimed. Uh, so the proposal is that the Commission will no longer have that early review role, uh, which can flag um, problems from an environmental or social perspective and um, ultimately improve outcomes in later stages of the development. Uh, I think uh, part of why that review role has been taken away is to perhaps separate the Commission from um, the, early, the earlier phase, the earlier review phase, as opposed to being the final decision maker. So the question is, how is that important independent review role um, going to be um, filled in the absence of the, the Commission performing that role? So um, turning to things that uh, perhaps aren't addressed in the bill that we think um, uh, Modern Planning Act uh, should provide for. Well, in the 2013 reforms, more than half of submissions to the government said that ecologically sustainable development should be the main object of the Act. So ESD, as it's called, is about making the environment and future generations more visible in decision making uh, than it has historically been. Uh, and we certainly agree that achieving ESD should be the main object of the Act, with various other important aims that a planning system should achieve flowing out from there. Uh, and, you know, Queensland's Sustainable Planning Act has that sort of a model if you're, if you're interested in taking a look. Um, but it's not enough to uh, simply have an object to do with um, ESD. You need to build in principles of ecologically sustainable development, like the precautionary principle and like conservation of biodiversity and intergenerational equity, into key decision-making points throughout the planning system. We also think that to give proper effect to um, ecologically sustainable development, um, the Act needs to be supported by clear state goals and targets um, around what we want from uh, or for the environment and environmental protection in New South Wales. There's a distinct lack of environmental targets uh, for um, decision makers and planning authorities to actually consider uh, when they're making decisions, either at a strategic level or a, a development assessment level. Uh, so we think the state government uh, should um, provide for those goals and targets. And another way that we can um, measure what is happening to the environment and what we're trying to protect is to uh, establish a set of regional environmental accounts, which is not about putting a dollar figure on everything. It's actually about uh, looking at different parts of the environment like soil, water quality, biodiversity, native vegetation condition and coverage, and tracking their, um, their status over time and um, measuring how we're performing against some of those goals and targets. Um, so that would be a, a bit of a package on ecologically sustainable development. Secondly, climate change. There's nothing in the, the Act as it stands and there's nothing in the Bill to respond to climate change. And this is despite the government setting an aspirational goal in November last year to achieve net zero emissions in New South Wales by 2050. So uh, New South Wales is one of the highest uh, polluting economies per capita uh, in the world and 2050 is not that far away. Uh, so. Uh, how do planning authorities take that sort of a, uh, uh, an issue into account? Um, where would we start? Well, we'd start with the object. So uh, we propose an object to respond to climate change through mitigation and adaptation action, and that this should be done in accordance with state and federal targets, global goals to avoid two degrees warming, and best available science for a safe and stable climate. And we then need to embed that in decision making. So, for example, that all strategic plans and, and state planning policies must consider climate change impacts and must consider whether they're actually achieving uh, the, uh, the object of uh, responding to climate change. And that all major projects would need to prepare what we're calling a climate impact statement, which sets out how uh, those projects contribute to uh, state and, 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 I suppose, national and global goals of protecting the climate. Uh, and also uh, how are they, or how are they conflicting with those goals uh, and are they um, adapting to climate change in a responsible way if it's long-term infrastructure or um, coastal development, for example. And then uh, the third category is a range of initiatives that we propose for boosting public confidence in the planning system as the government is aiming to do. Um, so firstly, making the, independent, making the environmental impact assessment process more independent through things like uh, professional accreditation of consultants, uh, peer review of significant environmental impact uh, reports, uh, and in some cases we could look at independent appointment of um, consultants for certain processes. 
So, for example, when the new biodiversity assessment method comes in under the Biodiversity Conservation Act later this year, uh, there is a, a process of accreditation for consultants who conduct that assessment, but uh, there's no requirement that uh, those consultants be appointed independently of the developer. Uh, so there's at least a perception there uh, of a potential conflict, um, and, and there could be the reality of a conflict. Um, Secondly, we think there should be a power to allow consent conditions to be kept up to date in response to new environmental information, technological advancement and evolving community expectations about uh, things like pollution. Uh, and we think that's a preferable alternative to the Bill's proposal of transferable conditions, uh, which is really about uh, transferring a condition that the regulator feels is adequately dealt with in another type of approval, like a, a pollution licence or a mining lease. Um, so transferable conditions are really about removing conditions from the consent and putting it somewhere else. We're talking about improving the conditions in the consent itself. Uh, thirdly, uh, we uh, think there is a need to restore and expand community merit appeal rights in relation to major projects on a more equitable basis uh, to the rights that the um, development industry is entitled to. And if you're interested in um, what we have to say on that, uh, you can see our, our uh, report on merit appeals in the planning system, which we released last year. Uh, and I should say, if you're interested in the, the climate change um, recommendations, you can view our report on our website called Planning for Climate Change. Um, and then finally, uh, in terms of um, complying development, so uh, so-called low-impact development that private certifiers can sign off on without um, public exhibition and development consent from a council, for example. We think that the um, reforms to the oversight of private certifiers needs to be brought forward and completed before we uh, expand um, complying development codes further. Um, so let's look a little deeper at some of the key issues and changes uh, that are afoot in the planning bill. So firstly, um, the new objects and the restructure of the Act. So uh, what do the objects do? Well, they set out the aims of the Act and um, the provisions of an Act should be uh, interpreted consistently with those objects. Currently, there are 10 equally weighted objects in the Act, um, such as to encourage the orderly and economic use of land in New South Wales, to encourage ecologically sustainable development, and so on. Um, the Act adds, removes and simplifies the objects. Uh, so, for example, there are some new objects relating to um, employment, uh, good design and um, protection and management of heritage, including Aboriginal cultural heritage. Uh, so um, there are also, uh, as Paul mentioned, a restructure of the Act, so that's probably more an issue for uh, the, the legal professionals in the room and planning professionals. There'll be uh, ten parts of the Act. Uh, it'll be um, renumbered and um, so... You know, I don't know if we need to have a wait for Section 79C or if that's going to remain Section 79C, but um, it'll be interesting to see what, uh, how we all adjust to that. And um, uh, it'll, yeah, it'll, it'll consolidate some of the provisions of the Act into these ten parts rather than being a bit um, bolted on uh, as the Act is now. In terms of our analysis of that, so... Uh, we'd suggest clarifying the new design objective. Um, so at the moment it just says to, to promote good design, I think. So we would say, well, what is that supposed to do? Uh, and we think it's to ensure healthy, inclusive, adaptable and sustainable communities. We think that's the role of good design in the planning system. Um, we support the, um, uh, the new object relating to heritage and Aboriginal cultural heritage. Uh, and we can expect that there'll be further reforms to Aboriginal cultural heritage in the form of a standalone act. So this bill doesn't deal in substance with, with cultural heritage protection. Um, there is some tinkering of the objective in relation to uh, ecologically sustainable development. We're, we're, uh, as proposed, the bill is throwing out the word encourage and throwing in the word facilitate for ecologically sustainable development. So um, make what you will of encourage versus facilitate. Um, but it also clarifies that what that means is integrating economic, environmental and social considerations into decision making, which is implicitly what the principles say you need to do anyway. Um, so that's not a hugely substantive change, but um, it is a bit of a missed opportunity uh, to 
uh, aim to achieve ESD, as we've said. And while there are a few other additions and subtractions in the proposed objects, the only really glaring gap is responding to climate change. So, second area of focus is community participation plans and minimum exhibition periods. So, uh, each planning authority in New South Wales, from the local council level uh, through the regional panels uh, and um, state level planning authorities like the department, the secretary, the minister, will need to prepare and exhibit a community participation plan. Uh, and this will set out um, how the authority will interact with the community and, and encourage the community to be involved in um, and comment on planning decisions. There will be uh, new uh, community participation principles or considerations that these authorities will need to take into account before they finalise these plans. Um, and there will also be a list of, of minimum public exhibition periods uh, for both strategic plans and certain types of uh, development applications. And uh, once decision makers have approved or refused a development and put conditions on it, they'll need to provide statements of reasons for the community and for stakeholders to understand why those decisions have been made. So um, we, uh, we think the community participation plans do hold some promise, uh, but uh, it really depends on how they're implemented and how seriously the planning authorities take their obligations. So, uh, the authorities need to consider those principles, but they don't need to satisfy them, for example. Um, and um, the, the commitments that these planning authorities sign up to in the community participation plans will only be mandatory if the plan says they are. So rather than um, having a default situation where whatever the plan says is mandatory, um, unless otherwise disclosed, uh, it's sort of the reverse of that. So um, uh, it's only mandatory if... Um, if the plan says that obligation is mandatory. Uh, there is some measure of accountability for the community in that the validity of these plans can be challenged within three months of the plans being made, uh, but that is uh, only if the legal procedures for making the plans weren't followed. Um, and uh, finally, uh, in relation to statements of reasons, we think that they are a, a good thing to um, uh, provide transparency and accountability uh, for the community to understand why decisions were made provided that that's a genuine exercise and not just a tick-the-box um, sort of an exercise. On minimum exhibition periods, so uh, on the left-hand side we have uh, a range of, of dates for um, draft strategic plans. It's generally 28 days for strategic level instruments, uh, 45 days for regional or district plans. And then on the right-hand side we've got development applications. So your standard DA will be exhibited for 14 days. Uh, higher impact development for 28 days, uh, which is actually slightly less than currently, so it's currently 30 days, and we would say um, you know, why deprive the community of that, that precious two days on the weekend or whenever it is to um, get your get your submissions in, so we say you know 30 days should be the minimum there. But uh, on the positive side, uh, that period will formally exclude the Christmas uh, holiday period uh, through to 10 January. So what's missing from that list of minimum exhibition periods? Well, things that we have picked up on are state environmental planning policies. There's no statutory minimum there. It'll be up to um, the, uh, the uh, minister or the planning authority making the plan. Uh, and uh, also part five, local infrastructure. You may, may not know what part five is, but um, basically local infrastructure um, doesn't need to follow the standard exhibition process um, that other uh, development does, and it's generally up to the discretion of the, um, the local council or the, um, the policy of the state agency as to how they're exhibited, if at all. Uh, and um, that's basically uh, retaining that approach of discretionary consultation on part five. So turning to local planning panels, local decision-making on um, development. So um, currently some local councils delegate complex development decisions to what are called independent hearing and assessment panels, and the scope of their role varies depending on uh, the council that has set them up, but they are established, these um, IHAPs as they're called, are established under the Act. Uh, they will be replaced or at least re um, revised with uh, three member local planning panels, uh, and the membership of those will be two technical experts in particular listed fields like um, architecture, urban planning, environment, 
economics or law, uh, and a third uh, representative uh, who will be a community representative. Uh, according to the Act, the panels won't be mandatory, but the regulations do uh, propose that in future there could be a requirement for these panels to be set up in certain circumstances, and uh, the state government is clearly keen on councils establishing them. Uh, councils would appoint the membership of these panels and uh, set the rules on what matters go to them, but again, those rules can be clarified uh, under the regulations. And uh, the bill also contains some more detailed governance around how those panels will function, and there will be model codes of conduct that are developed up um, in the future to guide how those um, bodies make decisions. Uh, but it's important to remember that um, local council staff will still be making them the vast majority of development uh, decisions on development applications that come the council's way, and it's really the more complex end of the spectrum. Uh, a minority of things will be handled by local panels, and if they go beyond a certain threshold by regional planning panels. So our analysis of that, well, um, as I say, um, local planning panels could um, uh, provide more clarity and consistent roles, um, but that can be balanced against the customisation of those panels to a particular local government area. Uh, so it really depends on your perspective on what those panels should do, but I think the theory behind delegating decisions to panels is to depoliticise the process or to make it more of a technical or even technocratic uh, exercise. Um, and that's been balanced in the local planning panels by having a community representative on those panels. But we do need to clarify, I suppose, how those community representatives are appointed. Does it include local council laws, for example? Um, and how do you vet or determine uh, you know, that that particular representative has the public interest at heart and, and equally for the, the more technical um, uh, appointees to the panels? Uh, and finally, what is the, um, the role of min the minister to direct uh, uh, councils to establish panels or refer matters to panels? That, that needs to be clarified as well because the discretion in the <coughs> bill as it stands is very broad. So shifting from a local level decision making to a state level, um, the uh, Planning Assessment Commission is to be renamed the Independent Planning Commission and its functions are to change somewhat. So currently, uh, the PAC has two main roles. It can review a major project proposal like a mine or a large urban development midway through the assessment process, uh, or it can determine whether to refuse or approve the project. And in some cases, it performs both of those roles, whether it's the same individuals or not. Um, <coughs> under the changes to the bill, uh, the remade commission will no longer play that review role in the early assessment of state significant development, but it'll continue to approve or refuse certain state significant developments. The planning minister will continue to have the power to direct the commission to hold public hearings prior to the determination of those um, developments. And this, I suppose, gets to the heart of our main concern, uh, and it's a long-standing concern that the bill doesn't address, which is that the Planning Act now says, or as it stands, the Planning Act says that a public hearing removes the right to seek a merits review of the decision in the Land and Environment Court. And the reason that disadvantages the community more than it disadvantages um, development proponents is because most of the PAC decisions are approvals that generally satisfy um, the, the developer. Uh, and it's really the, the community that is at a disadvantage um, for the vast majority of those decisions if their right to appeal that decision on the merits is taken away um, by a public hearing. Um, the government is attempting to address some of the deficiencies with the PAC and public hearing processes. Um, so, for example, public hearing would be held in two public hearings would be held in two stages. They'd be um, uh, more interactive and in, and uh, allow more question and answer than the current hearings. Uh, however, uh, community rights to merit appeals are a long-standing part of access to justice in the planning system, uh, and um, our report on merits appeals in the planning system uh, uh, explores some of their many public benefits. If you're interested, uh, the fact that um, uh, the Planning Act already limits uh, community merit appeal rights to high impact developments and that public hearings take away even those rights for the community uh, continues to undermine public confidence in the, in the process. And it also emphasises the growing disparity between the rights of developers on one hand who will have additional internal review rights and decisions and of the community on the other hand. So um, 
The final issue in detail is the repeal of the, uh, the Part 3A major project pathway. So uh, for those of you who are new to planning, uh, Part 3A was a controversial fast track process for major project approvals and it was introduced virtually overnight by the Labor government in 2005. And it also became a fast track for eroding public confidence in the system. Uh, when the coalition swept to power, as it did in 2011, it vowed to repeal Part 3A of the planning system and restore public confidence. Um, well, they did and they didn't, because the 2011 repeal bill enacted a transitional pathway for the hundreds of Part 3A projects that were already in the works. Uh, and obviously the government had to work out what to do with those projects. So um, some of those projects are still outstanding uh, six years later. Uh, and one of the worst parts of the Part 3A's um, long shadow, if you like, is that all of those projects under Part 3A can continue to seek modification under the very broad provisions of Part 3A. So fortunately, uh, this bill uh, uh, switches off Part 3A transitional modifications. Uh, for the, the lawyers in the room, it'll scrap Section 75W, um, it'll adopt the, the Section 96 <coughs> modification process, um, which is the standard modification process for other development. And all Part 3A projects, as they're called now, will transition uh, into either state significant development or state significant infrastructure, which are the updated categories of development for major projects now. And most of them will be state significant development rather than infrastructure. Uh, and where concept plans, uh, high level um, concept plans have been approved already, they will continue in the system for ongoing projects. So, um, sorry, so our analysis of that, um, we support removing the Part 3A modification process because it is too broad and discretionary. It's been around for too long. And we support those, those projects transitioning uh, to uh, a more rigorous, transparent and consistent modification process. Um, and basically we think the future modification should be assessed on whether they're substantially the same as the original approval. So um, I'll just touch briefly um, on related reforms um, that will have an impact on how the Planning Act is interpreted in the future. Uh, so uh, there are several significant reforms that you can um, read about in more detail in our, our briefing note, but the first is the Biodiversity Conservation Act 2016, which really is about the environmental assessment process um, and how biodiversity losses and gains from offsets are calculated. Uh, but we have a number of concerns about about that act. Um, secondly, the Coastal Management Act will reform the way that um, coastal areas are planned for, managed and, and protected into the future. And uh, there'll be an additional coastal SEP that's recently closed for consultation, so we're anticipating the um, commencement of that act as well. The Crown Lands Management Act will reform the way that public lands outside of state forests are, um, are regulated and they will um, uh, give a greater role to local councils and other authorities to manage uh, those areas through, through uh, plans of management and enable the, um, the selling off or the vesting of um, public lands in other authorities um, in, a, in a, um, uh, an easier way for the government, I suppose, but that will be bounded by certain um, safeguards as well. Um, there will be um, uh, new district plans for Sydney. Uh, they're currently up for consultation till the end of March, so if you're a Sydney sider and you're interested in district planning, uh, take a look at the Greater Sydney Commission website and um, what they're proposing uh, for a metro strategy amendment, which is the plan for growing the Sydney amendment. Um, and finally, um, complying development. So we'll continue to see um, a range of, um, of complying development codes being um, exhibited and, and uh, passed uh, by the government, which incrementally expands the, the amount of complying development in the system. Um, so, um, to conclude, I hope that's given you a bit of a, a rundown of um, some of the main changes in the bill, what we think are some pros, cons and missed opportunities, um, and whether or not you agree with anything that I've said today, um, submissions to the department are due on Friday the 31st of March. The department's released four explanatory documents by way of a summary of proposals, a guide to the bill, um, the draft bill itself, which runs to about 110 pages, and um, an overview of stakeholder feedback from an online survey that the government um, did last year. As for our resources, um, you can uh, check out edonsw.org.au for our briefing note, which recaps some of what I've said. Uh, we've got a podcast 
uh, about some of the key issues and our submission will be uh, uploaded uh, hopefully next week ahead of the due date.